Abstractionism is one of the defining moments in the era of modern art, and is characterized by a distinct disassociation from the rules of early 19th century art. Abstractionism comes in many forms, such as institutional, emotional, organic, curvilinear, decorative, romantic, or focuses on the mystical. Abstractionism serves as the backbone to all other movements defined in this modern era of art. So what is abstractionism? Abstractionism is a painting or sculpture that does not depict a person, place, or thing in the natural world. Abstractionism uses visual language of shape, form, color, and line to create a composition which may exist with a degree of independence from visual references in the world. Therefore, it is a form of non-objective art without any representational purpose to allow viewers to interpret each artwork's meaning in its own way. It can almost be described as a departure from reality. The founding artists of this movement, Wesley Kandinsky, Kazimir Malevich, Konstantin Rinkusi, and Piet Mondrian, were fed up with the pre precedence that art needed to have a purpose in order to have spiritual and cultural significance. This is why they sought out to achieve art that was pure abstraction. Pure abstract art is non-objective and non-representational, which means that the art isn't trying to mean anything, and therefore is creative and that each individual interprets the piece differently based upon their own experiences. This is why color and shapes are extremely significant to abstract pieces, because they all seemingly tell a different story. Therefore, form and color have been the main focus and subject of these abstract art pieces. The art movements that led to the development of abstract art were Romanticism, Impressionism, and Expressionism. Romanticism was a movement in the arts and literature that originated in the late 18th century, emphasizing inspiration, subjectivity, and the pride of the individual. Adopted from Romanticism, Abstractionism compared the idea that emotions could capture and captivate its audience. Impressionism is a style or movement in painting originating in France in the 1860s, characterized by a concern with depicting the visual impression of the movement, especially in terms of the shifting effect of light and color. Although Impressionism has its focus on the visuals in the painting, it did not try to achieve accurate depictions. Abstractionism was able to adopt the idea that the piece is more about the feelings that are evoked in the experience the art gives the viewer. Expressionism is a style of painting, music, or drama in which the artist or writer seeks to express emotional experience rather than impressions of the external world. Its typical trait is to present the world solely from a subjective perspective, distorting it radically for emotional effect in order to evoke moods or ideas. It's easy to draw comparisons between these three movements and see how they led to the birth of abstractionism. They all share the quality that the artistic piece is more than a superficial drawing meant to entertain but also a place to invoke emotions and take the subject away from the piece itself and onto the beholder. Bouncing away from the classical era of Renaissance art, James McNeil Whistler placed greater emphasis of the eyes and depiction of objects. Harmony in Blue and Silver, Trueville, in 1865, in the piece, you can see how in this painting, Whistler chooses different shades of the same color and also changed his stroke of brush across the canvas. To someone new to the art scene, this painting can come across as lazy and careless, but this is simply not true. Each stroke of the brush and each color shaded was carefully planned and properly executed. The idea of abstractionism itself is highly influenced by chemistry, physics, psychology, psychology, philosophy, poetry, and also music. All of these subjects are tied together with the industrial revolution and scientific rationalization of nature. The idea that we are moving forward and leaving behind the old ways of thinking and the rules which governed us is the birth of abstractionism. It started with a question, then a progression, and now maintains its place as the father of all modern art movements. The first artist we're going to talk about, and arguably the most important to the abstractionism movement, is Vasily Kandinsky. Often referred to as the father of abstractionism, 
He is credited with one of the very first truly abstract paintings. Kandinsky's creation of abstract work followed a long period of development and maturation of intense thought based on his artistic experiences. He called this devotion to inner beauty, fervor of spirit, and spiritual desire inner necessity, which is a central aspect of his art. Vasily Kandinsky uses interrelation between color and form to create an aesthetic experience that engage the sight, sound, and emotions of the public. He believed the total abstraction was the key to reaching the highest level of expression in art. In his eyes, art inspired from nature diminishes the emotions and involvement that art can offer. His technique was very successful at being disconnected from nature, but was still able to reveal a lot about the artist. Painting was also deeply spiritual for Kandinsky. He sought for a departure from reality and the pinnacle of human emotion through abstract forms and colors that have no boundaries and was interpreted differently by each observer. The response of, ob of observers is solely shaped by one's experience in life. Kandinsky labeled this the inner necessity of conveying universal human emotions and ideas. This intense fascination with spirituality has even led Kandinsky to label himself as a prophet whose mission was to share this ideal with the world for betterment of society. Kandinsky was also heavily influenced by music. Kandinsky believed musicians could evoke images in listeners' minds merely with sounds. He tries to mimic this process in his art. Kandinsky even said, Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. The colors Kandinsky uses in his paintings are all carefully selected and thought out. He believed each color had its own message and sound. Red is lively and confident and sounded like a trumpet. Green was peace with inner strength and sounded like the middle position violin. Blue was deep and supernatural. In particular, light blue sounded like a flute and dark blue sounded like a cello. Yellow was warm, exciting, disturbing, or even wild and sounded like a cello. White was silent but full of possibilities, like a pause in a harmonious melody. And then red, yellow, and green are all used to make small shapes stand out. So now that you understand a little about Kandinsky and what he's about, let's analyze two of his most important pieces. Composition 7, made in 1913 by Oil on Canvas, is commonly cited as the pinnacle of Kandinsky's pre-World War I achievement. A flurry of colors and shapes shows how Kandinsky tries to avoid all natural elements and seek a truly abstract composition. Kandinsky's fascination is exemplified in this piece because the swirls and livelihood of the painting directly mimics the nature of a symphony. Composition 7 tries to provoke Kandinsky's point that painting could evoke sounds the way music called to mind certain colors and forms. As the different colors and symbols spiral around each other, Kandinsky eliminated traditional references to depth and laid bare the different abstracted glyphs in order to communicate deeper themes and emotions common to all culture and viewers. The central oval seems almost as the eye of a compositional hurricane, surrounded by swirling masses of color and form. In Composition 7's final form, Kandinsky has obliterated almost all pictorial representation. Kandinsky took inspiration from music, especially the works of Richard Wagner. In a sense, the lines and shapes in this work try to evoke a level of emotion similar to that evoked by fine music. To Kandinsky, a complex work of visual arts was equivalent to a symphony. Composition 7 has a vortex-like design with a central oval that is crisscrossed by black lines around which a riot of colors and patterns swirl. The eyes try to pick out forms and make sense of them. Perhaps the shape in the bottom left is a, a boat with oars, or we see a bird on the branch near the center. A closer look, however, shows that nothing is representational in the painting, and the whole piece is purely abstract. Out of the chaos of the intersecting forms and colors comes harmony. Composition 7 has been called operatic, and Kandinsky believed that paintings could evoke sounds, just as much as music evoked images, and that both were a way of conveying emotion. The second painting we're going to analyze is a work from late Kandinsky that showcases his development in an artist over time. Composition 8, made in 1923, 
or 10 years later, on canvas by oil, is the geometric version of Kandinsky's art. This painting can be viewed as abstractionism on the other side of the spectrum. The painting has orderly geometric shapes that Composition 7 does not have. Kandinsky combined the ideas of suprematism and constructivism to create the picture of various colors and geometric shapes. Form, as opposed to color, structured the painting at a dynamic balance that pulses through the canvas. This radical change in style is a direct result in his post-war I experiences in Russia under suprematism movement. This shift in picture style is a direct example of how abstractionism can portray what's going on in someone's mind. Staying within the rules of abstract art, his paintings changed the experiences in his life and caused his views to change as well. This new work is an example of Kandinsky's clarified ideas about modern, non-objective art, particularly the significance of shapes like triangles, circles, and the checkerboard. Kandinsky relied upon hard-edged style to communicate the deeper content of his work for the rest of his career. In this work, circles, triangles, and linear elements create a surface of interacting geometric forms. The importance of circles in this painting foreshadows the dominant role they would play in many subsequent works. This painting also is more relaxed than the operatic style of Composition 7, but keeps the theme of a lively opera. They, the dashed come together similarly to a composer with a baton, and many of the rectangular panels have similarities to piano keys or xylophone. The diagonal lines also draw the eye to different selections of the painting where a different primary color dominates the eye and gives a sense of different textures throughout the whole thing. Kandinsky was also criticized by the public and artists alike that his shapes and colors were thrown together with no meaning and his art is not beautiful. Like Duchamp, Kandinsky reasoned that his art would not be about the stylistic beauty or deeper meaning. Malevich is also an avant-garde Russian painter who is best known for his creation of the suprematism movement. Suprematism refers to an abstract art based upon the supremacy of pure artistic feeling rather than on visual depiction of objects. The movement came when Russia was in a revolutionary state, ideas were becoming ferment, and old order was being swept away to make room for the new order. Suprematism is a huge influence of Kandinsky's late works 
and was a step toward a calm, structured abstractionism. Malevich started the movement to defy normal reason and to search for what he calls the zero degree. The zero degree is similar to what Kandinsky was searching for in his early stages of abstractionism. He wanted his audience to connect with the painting to the fullest extent and geometric abstraction was the most pure way to achieve that goal. The geometric shapes he focused on in particular were the square, circle, and cross. Malevich said regarding his technique, the varieties of shapes, sizes, and angles create a sense of depth in composition, making the squares, circles, and rectangles appear to be moving in space. This movement is key in a lot of Malevich's paintings, as he was obsessed with the idea of flight and motion in his art. This particular strategy was employed particularly after the Russian Revolution of 1917 that led to the creation of the Soviet Union. The changing times are thought to be represented in the movement of Malevich's paintings. One of Malevich's most important early works was Black Square. Made in 1915 on canvas with oil, this piece came out of Malevich's essay from Cubism and Futurism to Suprematism, the new realism in painting. Earlier in his career, Malevich had been influenced by Cubism. He believed that the Cubist had not taken the abstraction far enough, so the purely abstract shape of the black square, painted before the white background, is the single thing in the painting. The single black square is said to be the first geometric shape of non-objective form in art history. Even though the painting seems simple, there are little things like brush strokes, fingerprints, and colors. These details were incredibly thought out by Malevich and executed precisely. Malevich himself painted several layers of black on the square to give it a cracked final appearance, which may have been confused with aging of the painting. According to Malevich, the perception of such form should always be free of logic and reason, because the absolute truth can only be realized through pure feeling. For the artist, the square represented feelings, and the white represents nothingness, which is a void beyond feeling. Malevich saw the black square as a kind of godlike presence. In fact, black square was to become the new holy image for non-representational art. The square is imperfect. Its sides don't quite run parallel to the sides of the canvas. I think there are two reasons for this. Firstly, in all of Malevich's supremest paintings, the edge of the shapes never run parallel in a neat, clean way. The awkwardness and misalignment seems to activate the whole field of the painting. In black square, the misaligned edges activate the white border as a whole field, so it becomes a positive. Malevich's paintings, whilst made of simple elements, are extremely complex in their internal relationships. Black square is no exception. And the impossibility of separating the square from its ground. The second reason is that black square is still in the state of becoming, yet to be perfected. There's something tantalizing about a wonky square. Its imperfection establishes a human dimension to what would otherwise be a cold, abstract ideal. The second painting is White on White, made in 1918 on canvas by oil. This painting was made directly after the Russian Revolution of 1917 and was heavily influenced by the revolution itself. Melovich repeatedly referred to the white as a representation of the transcendent state reached through suprematism. White was the artist's symbol for the concept of the infinite, as the white square dissolves its material being into the slightly warmer white of the infinite surrounding. The, sight can, the, sight, the slight change in tone, however, distinguishes the abstract shape from the background of the canvas and encourages close viewing. The picture is thus bled of color, the pure white making it easier to recognize the signs of the artist's work in the rich paint texture of the white square. Texture of the white square being one of the basic qualities of painting as the suprematists saw it. Malevich dispenses with most of the characteristics of representational art with no sense of color, depth, or volume, leaving a simple monochrome geometrical shape, not precisely symmetrical, with imprecisely defined boundaries. Although the artwork is stripped of most detail, brush strokes are evident in this painting 
and the artist tried to make it look as if the tilted square is coming out of the canvas. Milovich intended the painting to evoke a feeling of floating, with the color white symbol symbolizing infinity, and the slight tilt of the square suggests movement. The main criticism of all of his art was the lack of meaning behind it. This, again, is a form of artistic peers rejecting the ideas of modern abstractionism movement. In 1915, Malevich was at the point of an extraordinary discovery. This is the year in which he created the seminal black square painting now in the Tretyakov. And this is the same year in which suprematism, 18th construction, this important and very rare composition was also executed. Malevich here is doing away with everything figurative, uh, everything objective, the forms themselves reign supreme in his square format composition. Malevich draws here on cubism, but takes it into his very own aesthetic. He was the creator of the suprematist movement, and it was this that caused such an extraordinary legacy with artists that followed, whether it was Kandinsky and Mondrian in the teens, 20s and 30s, but also the post-war generation, artists like Rothko, Donald Judd, and Ellsworth Kelly, who kind of drew on that suprematist legacy. What you have here is this extraordinary play of the elements of the laws of gravity, dynamism and space, all coming together in this sense of tension and release. This painting has a long exhibition history. It was first shown in Russia in 1915. It was possibly also included in the seminal 010 show in Petrograd of the same year. And then in 1927, it was first shown to the Western audience in two exhibitions that Malevich himself accompanied, one in Warsaw and one in Berlin. This painting represents a real opportunity for a collector looking for major icons of 20th century abstract art. 1915, a hundred years ago today, and still as modern and as contemporary and shocking as it was then. Piet Mondrian is a Dutch painter who is best known for his creation of geometric abstractionism. Mondrian aimed to show through his art the balance of forces that governs nature and the universe. He believed that his art represented the essence of spiritual energy. Mondrian, similar to other abstract artists of his time, was part of a rebellious group breaking away from the old rules of art. He was a part of the De Stahl or the Style movement, which is also known as neoplasticism. Mondrian sets forth the limitations of neoplasticism in his essay, Neoplasticism in Pictorial Art. He wrote, This new plastic idea will ignore the particulars of appearance, that is to say, natural form and color. On the contrary, it should find its expression in the abstraction of form and color, that is to say, in the straight line in the clearly defined primary color. With this in mind, his art would only allow primary colors, grayscale colors, which are black, gray, and white, squares, rectangles, and straight horizontal or vertical lines. The de Stahl movement posited the fundamental principle of the geometry of the straight line, the square, and the rectangle, combined with the strong asymmetrality, the predominant use of pure primary colors with the black and white, and the relationship between positive and negative elements in an arrangement of non-objective forms and lines. The main distinction to stall art has from the geometric abstraction art is that restriction in color. The use of the straight lines in only primary colors was thought to mimic the elements of nature. The main focus of this group of artists was to give off a a personalized feeling. The rules Mondrian created with geometric abstractionism is slightly different than his old rules of neoplasticism. First, the painting should include repetition, patterns, and distinct colors. They also had to include geometric shapes such as circles, squares, triangles, and rectangles. These shapes were picked in particular because they were in the most non-naturalistic of all the geometric shapes. This non-naturalistic idea also translated onto the canvas that was used for art. Only a flat picture plane was acceptable, 
as it was the least natural dimension to paint on. Because all of these non-natural elements involved, geometric abstractionism is considered the purest form of abstraction because, because it has absolutely no reference or association with the natural world. Mondrian's work was intended to convey what he called absolute reality. This spiritual linkage is similar to Malevich and Kandinsky in that they all believed our pure abstraction will, would allow the transcendence of human emotion. The first painting we're going to analyze from Mondrian is directly erected from his Distel movement. Composition with large red plane, yellow, black, gray, and blue created in 1921 is his most profound neoplastic painting. This oil painting consists of geometric figures, in particular, variations of squares and rectangles. Combinations of thick and thin planar lines are used to form the boundary between the color blocks in the painting. These planar lines can be described as flat and simplistic. They are not detailed and show little brush detail. The planes that are created by these lines are a variety of sizes and colors. In this painting, the lines do not create distinctive borders but instead, the rectangular planes fully extend onto the edges of the canvas. Mondrian uses red, white, blue, and yellow as the colors for the individual planes. Mondrian always began with a white canvas, but he did not leave the white planes of this painting untouched, but rather painted with a white paint instead of leaving the original canvas exposed. The cracks in the paint within the white planes can be seen clearly. Each plane varies in size. The red plane is nearly nine times larger than the blue plane, which is subsequently about nine times as large as the yellow plane. This piece is an in, in, indicative representation of the works that were created by Mondrian during the decline of the De Stael movement. This piece was erected out of all of this De Stael move, style movement, which Mondrian was extremely influential in development and exploration of this philosophy. Neoplasticism pursued the goal to create new pictorial rhythms through a novel plastic representation of space. Mondrian believed that the success of a neoplastic painting depends on the inspired in intuition of the maker. The style can be thought of somewhat transitional style out of cubism and into a full-fledged exploration and engagement of distal. The basic principles that the distal movement promoted were a stripping down of the traditional forms into simple, basic, geometric components or elements. The composition from these separate elements of formal configurations, which are perceived as wholes, while remaining clearly constructed from individual and independent elements, studied in sometimes extreme asymmetry of composition or design. An exclusive use of intersecting horizontal and vertical lines, along with the pigment primary colors, plus neutral colors or tones, the most distinctive figure in composition with red, blue, and yellow is a large red square located in the top right corner. This particular square takes up over half the canvas. This piece also has a very distinctive thick and pronounced line separating a large white plane in the upper left corner into two individual planes. These two elements draw the viewer's eye inward and then force the eye to proceed in a downward manner that also allows the viewer to experience the paintings first as an individual element, and then as a whole. As mentioned previously, his pa palette consists of extremely hard primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, as well as neutrals, black and white. The use of these bright distinctive shades in such a way emphasizes one of the main concepts of de Stael ideology, referring to a returning state of simplicity. Mondrian used primary colors and neutrals, and this idea of simplicity of form are used on white planes on the piece and the white spaces are not to be thought of as blank or open, but hold as much importance as the bold color shapes in the center of this piece. The grid configuration that Mondrian used by implementing a network of lines worked well to increase the cohesion not only between colored planes themselves, but also between the colored and uncolored portions of the work. The composition is very... Is, uh, the composition is very repetitive by using the same basic shapes and colors. However, Mondrian would not have perceived his work as repetitive, but instead would have seen his piece as a whole experience made up of individual parts that generates a statement on the relationship between the individual and the collective of, or universal. The use of horizontal and vertical lines or elements is prevalent in this piece. The horizontal lines signify a sense of rest and repose, while the vertical lines communicate a sense of height to the piece, 
Working together as an overall piece, the lines together create a sense of stability and solid, sol solidarity. In particular, Mondrian's use of 90 degree angles throughout his composition evokes a sense of structural stability that reflects the ideas of permanence and reliability. Mondrian was attempting to portray this sense of stability through his paintings and evoke sentiments of utopian society rather than face the instability of the world in its current state. Since his symmetry was praised in this style, Mondrian uses juxtaposition, proportion, and location to create an overall harmony in his painting without definitively balancing the elements. Aesthetically speaking, Mondrian used the idea of opposition in his painting to achieve this quality. The second painting from Mondrian, Tableau I, a lozenge with four lines in gray, painted in 1926, follows the development of his now matured neoplastic style. Mondrian sought to express a more dynamic rhythm in his abstractions. He began producing lozenge paintings as early as 1919 in order to create a more vibrant tension on the picture plane. The lozenge paintings are known as such because of their diamond shape that results from Mondrian using a unconventional orientation for his square canvases, turning them on a 45 degree angle with a corner at the top. In this particular composition, the lines appear to extend beyond the edges of the canvas as they intersect with the diagonals of the diamond corner at the top. By shifting the orientation of the canvas, Mondrian provided an important precedent for the shaped canvases of the minimalists in 1960s. With the complete absence of color in this painting, Mondrian has also prefigured the minimalists' interest in pure form and favoring gray, white, and other muted colors. Mondrian also faced criticism that his paintings were the same thing over and over again. If you're some who pays close attention to detail like Madrin, you'll see the subtle differences even in the thickness of the black borders. Every one of his works required extreme precision on his part, just like how he painted white over his already white canvas to get the full experience out of his art. These bold colors and grids are the hallmark of artist Piet Mondrian. But the same artist, still known today for his instantly recognizable patterns, started out painting these. This summer, an exhibit at the Gamente Museum in The Hague traces Mondrian's path from that to this. Benno Temple, the museum's director, explains. So in the Netherlands, there has always been a very strong tradition in landscape painting, dating back from the 17th century. And it was almost a golden rule. The horizon was low, so you had one third of the painting being a landscape and two thirds of the painting being sky with the famous Dutch clouds. But even in his early career, Mondrian is ready to break the rules. He has his early painting around 1900, a ditch by a farm. A landscape with the horizon very high, so there's almost no sky. And there is a tree standing in the foreground of the painting, dividing the painting into, you could almost say, squares and lines. In 1911, Mondrian moves to Paris, where the Cubist painters Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso influenced Mondrian to experiment with increasingly abstract styles. In 1915, Mondrian returns to the Netherlands and joins the Laren Artist Colony, where he befriends two artists who push him even further toward abstraction. Together, these three participate in the founding of the De Stijl movement. Like many artistic movements at the time, this group tried to make a definite break from the past. No more Dutch clouds and windmills for these guys. Mondrian calls his style at this time neoplasticism. Mondrian writes, This new plastic idea will ignore the particulars of appearance. On the contrary, it should find its expression in the abstraction of form and color, that is to say, in the straight line in the clearly defined primary color. It all boils down to straight lines and primary colors, the signature Mondrian look you see in stores and on runways today. But despite how far Mondrian's style evolved from Dutch landscapes, it's still possible to see a connection to his early works. Although they're completely different, one is figurative, the other is abstract. You see that it's almost the same division of picture planes. 
And that's not done on purpose, it's done by intuition. Konstantin Brinkusi is often regarded as the father of modern abstract sculpture. His visionary sculptures often exemplify ideal and archetypal representations of their subject matter. His sculptures are deceptively simple, with their reduced forms aiming to reveal hidden truths. Brincusi, breaking away from the old rules of sculpting, worked directly with his materials. His new technique of sculpting was by directly carving rather than working with plaster or clay models. Before, carved sculptures had always been based on preconceived models, but with this new idea, his sculptures weren't trying to be anything, but it was entirely its own thing in itself. Brancusi's goal was to create sculptures that conveyed the true essence of his subjects. He did this by concentrating on highly simplified forms, similar to the reduction of art to geometric shapes in geometric abstractionism. Brancusi moved to Paris to continue his study of sculpture and adopted many of the modernist ideas of abstractionism. His sculptures are often very simplistic, with definitive symmetry. We oftentimes see cubes, cylinders, and pyramidal shapes, which two-dimensionally are squares, triangles, and rectangles. His sculptures are also truly abstract, but Brancusi insisted they were not. He describes his sculptures as representational works of nature, claiming they, that they disclosed a fundamental, often concealed reality. Brancusi's work was largely fuel, fueled by myths, folklore, and primitive cultures. These traditional, old-world sources of inspiration formed a unique contrast to the often sleek appearance of his works, resulting in a distinctive blend of modernity and timelessness. The materials Brancusi used, primarily marble, stone, bronze, wood, and metal, guided the specific forms he produced. He paid close attention to his mediums, meticulously polishing pieces for days to achieve a gleam that suggested infinite continuity into the surrounding space. The first sculpture we're going to analyze is the Kiss. Mancusi's first version of the Kiss, created in 1907, was a full-size sculpture that resembled two human figures. The piece mimics more traditional sculpting in that it was created with a clay template and final piece in mind. His second and more important version of the Kiss showcases the stylistic changes he made while studying in Paris. His new sculpture was now geometrically focused. The two figures are vaguely distinguishable, and the entire figure resembles a cube stone. The influence of cubism is also reflected in the sharply defined corners, which allows the piece to maintain a definitive structure. Its composition, texture, and material highlight Brancusi's fascination with both the forms of spirituality in African, Assyrian, and Egyptian art. That attraction is ultimately what led Brancusi to craft the kiss using direct carving. He was able to retrieve the full potential out of stone plaster with direct carving because he could feel the stone on his fingertips and translate it into his art. He believed the sculpture placed in the hands of a contractor is no longer art. His own abstract style emphasizes simple geometric lines that balance forms inherent in his materials with the symbolic illusions of the representational art. His second painting we will be analyzing is The Endless Column, made in 1918. This focus reflected Brancusi's strong and persistent affinity for the sacred, cosmic, and mythical. Endless Column also treats another theme of Brancusi's work, the idea of infinity, here suggested by the repetition of identical rhombus-like shapes. The most famous of Brancusi's were Endless Columns, was the version that served as the centerpiece of the tripartite sculptural memorial to fallen soldiers in World War I, erected in Targ Zhu, Romania, in 
So what? Why is abstractionism important in your life and mine? To begin, we can thank abstractionism for laying out rules that all modern art utilizes today. The radical founders of abstractionism have effectively moved us out of the classical art era and into the modern one. These men have inspired a new appreciation of art that has included more people than ever. We see abstract ideas everywhere, from the clothes you wear to the buildings we walk in. Most importantly, Abstractionism has completely modified the way we interpret art and has opened people's minds up to multiple perspectives of the world we live.